What's in a name? That which we call a city by any other name would smell as sweet. Some place nicknames are obvious. Denver, Colorado is the Mile High City because it's precisely one mile above sea level. Dallas, Texas is the Big D. Everything's bigger in Texas. But which American city is also called the Emerald City? Which state is the land of Lincoln? What's a Buckeye or a Sooner? My name's Moxie, and this is your Brain on Facts. Let's start our tour of land labels and city sobriquets with one of the cuter sounding nicknames, Boston, Massachusetts moniker of Beantown. The origins are a bit nebulous. It could come from the baked beans that Puritan settlers would fix up on Saturday and keep warm in crocks by the hearth all day on Sunday, as they were forbidden from working, even cooking, on the Sabbath. It won't shock you that Las Vegas is called Sin City, what with the 24-hour drinking, loose blue laws, gambling, and strip clubs. But no brothels. Not legal ones, anyway. Prostitution isn't legal in Clark County, which contains the city of Las Vegas, and half a dozen other counties in the state. A more recent name with a similar feel is New Orleans' nickname of the Big Easy. Although there was supposedly a dance hall that went by that name in the early 1900s, no one was really using the term to refer to the city until the 1970s. Two people are credited for popularizing the name, Betty Gallaud and James Conaway. Betty Gallaud was a newspaper columnist who started using the term as a sort of response to New York's Big Apple moniker. Jimmy Conaway was a writer who published the crime novel The Big Easy in 1970, which was made into a movie starring Dennis Quaid in 1986. Philadelphia, Pennsylvania is the city of brotherly love. And that one's a pretty straight translation. The word Philadelphia is from the Greek, philos for love, and adelphos for brother. William Penn named it such because he wanted his city to be a place where all religions were tolerated in keeping with his Quaker beliefs. The original name for Los Angeles, and I apologize for the pronunciations here, was El Pueblo de Nuestra Señora de Los Angeles. In English, the town of Our Lady of the Angels, or some variation thereof. There's a fair amount of contention among historians as to whether the name might also have included phrases like Señora Lorena, De la Riena, or De la Porquiancula. Either way, that's not going to fit on a highway sign. The origin of Chicago's nickname of the Windy City is surprisingly complicated. The most popular theory goes that while New York and Chicago were competing to host the 1893 World's Columbian Exposition, an editor at the New York Sun wrote a piece that dismissed Chicago as that Windy City. However, there's evidence the term existed before this reference, and no one's even sure if that editorial actually existed. Barry Popick, a consultant for the Oxford English Dictionary, insists that Cincinnati actually coined the term, and it wasn't a compliment. Windy referred to both the weather and to long-spoken politicians. If the city ever wanted to rebrand, for this reporter's money, they need look no further than Carl Sandburg's eponymous 1914 poem for inspiration. Hog butcher for the world, tool maker, stacker of wheat, player with railroads and the nation's freight handler. Stormy, husky, brawling, city of the big shoulders. But the wind is good too, I guess. Some cities take their names from the things they produce. If you know anything about Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, you know it's an industrial city with a long history of steel production. This goes back to the late 1800s when Andrew Carnegie brought his Carnegie Steel Company, later enveloped into the U.S. Steel Corporation, to the city. The mills employed many of the locals, so it only made sense to make the alloy part of the place's nickname. Also, it sounds a lot better than naming it after the other thing the area produces, coal. Detroit, Michigan's name is French for straight, as in a narrow waterway, but most people think of it as the Motor City. 
People like Henry Ford and Ransom Olds set up shop in Michigan as they began to build the automotive industry. Factories need workers, so people moved to Detroit for jobs and the city grew. Though life has not been so easy for the residents in the past few decades, at least they can lay claim to two nicknames for things they produce. In 1959, Barry Gordon hung a sign bearing Hitsville, USA in the front window of his recording studio, Motown Records. Just as the Ford production line cranked out unprecedented numbers of cars, Motown Records issued forth a staggering number of new artists and songs as part of the Motown sound, forever altering the American pop culture landscape. Baltimore, Maryland's agnomen of Charm City is quite distantly removed from its former unofficial heading of Bodymore Murderland. It got this nickname through an ad campaign. In 1975, Mayor William Donald Schaefer called on some of the area's top marketing minds to help Baltimore's poor public image. One of them, Bill Evans, wrote the line, Baltimore has more history and unspoiled charm tucked away in quiet corners than most American cities out in the spotlight. The team zeroed in on Charm City and produced a series of ads that even featured charm bracelets on the bottom. Probably the best well-known city nickname is the Big Apple, New York, New York. The term Big Apple existed long before it got attached to New York City to describe something regarded as the most significant of its kind, an object of desire and ambition. In 1909, author Edward Martin was referring to New York as the Big Apple, saying the rest of the country feels the Big Apple gets a disproportionate share of the national sap. By the 1920s, racetrack enthusiasts and jazz musicians had spread it into popular usage. Before, the New York Convention and Visitors Bureau president, Charles Gillette, turned it into a tourism campaign. NYC has another nickname, best known to fans of DC's Dark Knight, that of Gotham City. New York was Gotham before the first comic book was ever printed. The name comes from an English village that originally bore the name and a reputation that could favorably be called Mixed. The story goes that King John, the villainous usurper of the legend of Robin Hood, planned to travel through the small town of Gotham on his way to nearby Nottingham. Any road the king traveled on would become a public highway, and the villagers didn't want that, in part because they would be taxed to pay for it. So they hatched a plan to feign madness. It was believed in those days that madness was contagious. If they really sold it, maybe the king would stay away. And sell it they did. Some men built a fence around a bush to prevent a cuckoo bird from escaping. When the bird flew away, they built the fence higher. Others were seen trying to drown an eel in a pond. Their ruse worked, leading to the saying, there are more fools pass through Gotham than remain in it. The villagers were also dubbed the wise men of Gotham. The king stayed far away. Tales of their remarkable foolishness spread, and they were collected in various books, including The Merry Tales of the Mad Men of Gotham, published in 1565. American author Washington Irving, best known for the tales of Sleepy Hollow, became aware of the tales and was the first person to link Gotham in England to New York in the U.S. He repeatedly mocked Manhattan by referring to it as Gotham, or Gotham, in satirical writings in 1807. The nickname stuck, with many local businesses even adopting the name. This wouldn't be the last time Irving made an impact on American history. His writings gave us the phrase, the almighty dollar, and his character of Diedrich Knickerbocker is where the New York Knicks basketball team get their name. He also twisted our history a bit. He's principally responsible for school children being taught that the Spanish believed the earth was flat until Columbus proved otherwise, when in fact people had accepted the earth's spherical reality for centuries Columbus was trying to prove that it was smaller than everyone else said it was, and shaped like a pear. But circling back to Gotham or Gotham and New York, it was the popularity of the name Gotham with business owners 
that led to it being used as the Big Apple copycat of the Caped Crusader. Detective Comics writer Bill Finger literally flipped through the phone book to find inspiration for a name and spotted the listing for one Gotham Jewelers. So which city did we tease at the top as Emerald City? It's actually Seattle, Washington. The name was chosen in a 1982 contest held by the Seattle King County Convention and Visitors Bureau to come up with the best nickname for the city, and Emerald City won. It's easy to see why when you read the winning entry describing Seattle as the jewel of the Northwest, the queen of the evergreen state, the multifaceted city of space, elegance, magic, and beauty. I should get that guy to write copy for me. Less a fact than a piece of unsolicited advice, no one in the city of Atlanta actually refers to it as hot Atlanta. That's something tourists and people who've never been there do. The same rule applies to shortening San Francisco to Frisco or New Orleans to Nolens. Share or retweet this week's episode post if you strongly agree or strongly disagree with that statement. We get to travel abroad now for this week's featured review, our first review on the iTunes UK site. Mr. Enriquez writes, More fun than Trivial Pursuit, and you don't have to wait for your turn. Moxie the host gives you facts on anything and everything with a pleasant voice and comedic delivery. Whatever subject you can think of, Moxie has done it, and if she hasn't, she will, and she will do it well. Definitely give this podcast a listen. Thank you so much, Mr. Enriquez. You kind of feel bona fide when you get a review from overseas. But that doesn't mean I would value the domestic ones any less. You can leave a review in most popular podcast apps, especially the Apple Podcast app. Or if you're on Facebook, pop over to facebook.com slash yourbrainonfacts and leave it under the reviews heading there to also be automatically featured on our website. Not content to give our cities multiple names, we also have official epithets for our states. The easiest and most obvious way to come up with one is to base it on the state's natural features. Not about to be known exclusively for its size, Rhode Island is the Ocean State. It boasts nearly 400 miles of ocean shoreline, including its coves, bays, and islands. That's no mean feat when the entirety of the state measures 37 miles wide and 48 miles long. The Green Mountain State of Vermont was originally settled by both the British and French in the 18th century, and the nickname comes from a French phrase, Montagne Vert, which means Green Mountain. It also lends its name to a very nice burlesque troupe that joined forces with my Game of Thrones burlesque tour. If you're ever up Lake Champlain Way, take in one of their shows. The origins of Massachusetts being called the Bay State could be one of two things. The fact that early pioneers settled on Cape Cod Bay, or the Massachusetts Bay Company, which governed New England until 1684. The sandy beaches and subtropical climate of Florida make it a lock for the Sunshine State, and not, as Homer Simpson calls it, America's Wang. Landlocked Arkansas is the natural state, owing to its abundance of beautiful natural geographical features, like rivers, caves, hills, and valleys, as well as a healthy variety of native plants and animals that call the state home. There would be no overlooking the Grand Canyon, and so no more fitting name for Arizona than the Grand Canyon State. The Grand Canyon is one of the most famous natural features in the world. Bonus fact, Two different postage stamps featuring the Grand Canyon have been issued and then summarily recalled due to glaring factual errors. In January of 2000, the U.S. Postal Service issued a Grand Canyon stamp, but the photo used was mirrored, meaning it was backwards. And this was only one year after the Postal Service mistakenly labeled the Grand Canyon as a Colorado landmark on 100 million stamps. Alaska was the 49th state to join the Union, but that's only part of its nickname, the Last Frontier. 
Only one-third of the land in the entire massive state has been defined by cities and towns, leaving vast expanses of undisturbed, pristine wilderness. Similarly rugged is the Mountain State of West Virginia. It has the highest average altitude of any state east of the Mississippi. Some state monikers honor specific people. Illinois is the land of Lincoln, even though Lincoln was actually born in Kentucky. He began his political career in Illinois and was living in the state when he was elected president in 1860. Iowa's nickname of the Hawkeye State honors Native American leader Chief Black Hawk, who was relocated to Iowa after settlers took over his people's land. One of the Iowa newspaper publishers was friends with Black Hawk and renamed his paper the Hawkeye and Iowa Patriot to honor him. The Hawkeye State as a name was suggested by a judge and made official in 1838. A quick age check. When you hear the name Hawkeye, do you instantly think Avengers, MASH, or Last of the Mohicans? Look for a poll on our social media after this episode comes out. One nickname that's perplexed me for years was Oklahoma's The Sooner State. Sooner than what? Thanks to the great podcast, Anytown USA, we have our answer. If you saw the middling Tom Cruise, Nicole Kidman movie Far and Away, you saw the Oklahoma land race, where settlers were given plots of land if they could reach them first, jump the gun, and risk being shot. Many people were sneaky enough, though, to get out into the plots before the race to illegally stake their claim. These folks were called Sooners, and the name stuck. In 1908, the University of Oklahoma even adopted the name for its football team. Another state with competing origin stories for its nickname is North Carolina, a.k.a. the Tar Heel State. One school of thought holds that it's to do with North Carolina being one of the world's largest producers of tar, pitch, rosin, and turpentine in the 18th and 19th centuries. The other leading contender can be found in Webster Clark's Histories of the Several Regiments from North Carolina in the Great War, 1861-1865, to published in 1901, before a much better known Great War. James M. Ray of Asheville speaks of an 1863 incident. In a fierce battle in Virginia, where their supportive column was driven from the field, North Carolina troops stood alone and fought successfully. The victorious troops were asked in a condescending tone by some Virginians who had retreated, Any more tar down in the old North State, boys? The response came quickly, No, not a bit. Old Jeff's bought it all up. Is that so? What is he going to do with it? The Virginians asked. He's going to put it on your heels to make you stick better in the next fight. There are also any number of urban legends that this Confederate general or that one said of a particular group of soldiers that they stayed and fought as if they had tar on their heels. South Dakota was renamed for a feature that would have been impressive enough on its own, but then some folks thought it would be a keen idea to carve faces into it and make South Dakota the Mount Rushmore state. Mount Rushmore features the faces of Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, Theodore Roosevelt, and Abraham Lincoln, each about 60 feet tall, carved into the Black Hills, and took sculptor Gutson Borglum and his crew 15 years to complete. Brace yourself for a barrage of bonus facts. The monument was intended not to be busts, but to depict the entire bodies of the four presidents. The project ran out of money, and the sculptor Borglum died when they'd only about reached the collarbones. Tourism officials in South Dakota had wanted the mountainside to depict Wild West icons, but Borglum took it a whole different direction, thanks in part to his pronounced fangirling over personal friend Teddy Roosevelt. Borglum had also wanted to create a vault behind the heads to house the Constitution and Declaration of Independence. Even if you didn't already know that this land had been taken away from the native people when the government reneged on a treaty, it's almost always a safe bet to assume. It was stolen from the Sioux Nation when gold was discovered in 1874 
as reported to his superiors by everyone's favorite, General George Armstrong Custer. 106 years later, the Supreme Court declared that the taking of the land had been unconstitutional and ordered compensation to be paid in what amounts to over $1 billion when adjusted for inflation. But the Sioux Nation refuses to claim the money. They don't want the money. They want their land back. Another safe bet for a state brand is native flora. Georgia is, of course, the peach state, and Ohio is the buckeye state. But what is a buckeye? It's a type of nut related to horse chestnuts and the tree that bears it, as well as a tasty confection made of peanut butter partially covered in chocolate. During the late summer months, fields all over Kansas are covered in wild sunflowers stretching their faces to the sun, earning it the name the Sunflower State. The sunflower was once considered a weed by some, while others admired its ability to grow in harsh conditions. The distinction between flower and weed is so arbitrary anyway. Maine takes its moniker, the Pine Tree State, from the early days of its statehood, when the tall trunks of white pine trees, some of the tallest in North America, were used to make the masts of ships. When you think of flowers associated with southern states, few are more iconic than the magnolia, which, combined with their natural ubiquity, is why Mississippi chose to call itself the Magnolia State. Magnolias are both their official flower and the official state tree. A tree less in need of celebration, at least according to my cousin from Florida, is the palmetto, but that didn't stop South Carolina from being rechristened the Palmetto State. The Palmetto had more of a role in the state's history than merely existing there. While the Revolutionary War was raging in June of 1776, colonial soldiers defended Charleston against the British from a fort made out of palmetto tree trunks and emerged victorious. Is the grass in Kentucky really blue? Well, it would be silly for them to call themselves the Bluegrass State if it wasn't. The native grasses of the region flowered with small blue buds, which gave the fields a bluish tint. Today, the nickname is associated with both the actual grass and bluegrass music. Continuing the color theme, Washington is the Evergreen State, so named for the abundance of evergreen forests across the area that contain over two dozen native tree species. You can't go wrong with native fauna, either. An abundance of brown pelicans gave Louisiana the name the Pelican State. Alabama is called the Yellowhammer State, from soldiers adding bits of yellow cloth to their uniform that looked like the native Yellowhammer birds to mark where they came from. Beavers, with their ability to change waterways and their valuable fur, were an integral part of Oregon's formative history, making it the beaver state. An animal with a less industrious and more cantankerous reputation lent its name to Wisconsin. It is the badger state. This nickname has an intermediary step, though. In the 1800s, miners lived in hillside caves nicknamed badger dens, so the miners themselves came to be called badgers. Equally high on the list of short animals not to mess with is the one from which Michigan adopted its name, the wolverine. Many say the state got the name from the large number of wolverines that once populated the area, but others believe it's a result of the usually forgotten Toledo War. During the dispute over a small piece of land, Ohioans were rumored to have said Michiganders were as vicious and bloodthirsty as wolverines. Bonus fact, before his first turn as the comic book character Wolverine, Hugh Jackman wasted three weeks studying the behavior of wolves to incorporate into his performance, not knowing that the wolverine is a wholly unrelated species. Got valuable things in the ground? That's another good source for a state nickname. Idaho takes its name not from its famous potatoes, but from the wealth of precious minerals and gems, including jade, topaz, zircon, and star garnets, the state mineral, making it the gem state. 
The word Ohio means gem of the mountain in the language of the Shoshone. California is the golden state, owing to all the fuss and bother over shiny yellow rocks back in 1848. Nevada is the silver state for a similar reason. The large number of granite formations and quarries merit New Hampshire's nickname, the Granite State. Montana is the treasure state, in reference to the state's high production of gold, silver, and copper. For a time, it was called the Stubbed Toe State, from all the amateur hikers bumbling around. I'll confess, I thought their official nickname was Big Sky Country. Who doesn't love a good origin story? Delaware was the first of the original 13 states to ratify the Constitution, and so calls itself the first state. Connecticut is the Constitution state, since some historians believe the fundamental orders of 1638 and 39 were written in Connecticut as the first rules of government to be used by the U.S. Becoming a state in 1876, 100 years after the Declaration of Independence was signed, Colorado is the Centennial State. Virginia is the Old Dominion State. Virginia is also unofficially known as the Mother of Presidents because it was the birthplace of Washington, Madison, Wilson, Tyler, Jefferson, Monroe, Taylor, and Harrison. If you've been out in the vast expanse of Texas at night, you know it has a lot of stars. The lone star that gives the state its name comes from the Texas state flag. Which had one fewer stars than the flag of Mexico that they were separating from. Pennsylvania is the Keystone State. A keystone is the center stone in an arch. Take that out, and the whole thing falls down. The Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and the Gettysburg Address were all written in Pennsylvania, and it's about in the center of the 13 colonies. From here on out, let's call the reasons for state nicknames assorted. Wyoming is the equality state, since it gave women the right to vote before it even had statehood, in hopes of correcting the six to one male to female population imbalance. They even refused to rescind the right to vote when being made a state. Missouri is the show me state, after an 1899 speech by a congressman who said. I come from a state that raises corn and cotton and cockleburs and Democrats, and frothy eloquence neither convinces nor satisfies me. I am from Missouri. You have got to show me, and it just kind of stuck. Tennessee is the volunteer state, referring to the Mexican War when the governor asked for 2,600 volunteers, and an overwhelming 30,000 men turned up. Minnesota is not called the North Star State because of some propensity for the navigation-aiding North Star, but because it was declared by its first governor to be the Star of the North. Many people also call it the Land of Ten Thousand Lakes, though it actually has more than eleven thousand. Maryland is called the Old Line State. It has nothing to do with the North-South divide surveyed by Messrs. Mason and Dixon. Historians say the nickname came from George Washington in reference to the bravery of the Maryland Line troops. In 1959, we officially said "Aloha," which means "hello," to the Aloha State of Hawaii. This also meant saying "Aloha," which is also "goodbye," to their native monarchy. Utah is the Beehive State, either because Mormon settlers brought beehives with them. Or from the beehive as a symbol of tenacity, competence, and strength. The jury is still out on that one. North Dakota is the Peace Garden State, in tribute to the International Peace Garden that straddles the Canadian border, which features, among other things, a large floral clock that stretches 18 feet in diameter. Though it's the butt of many jokes based on the smells of its industrial areas. New Jersey is officially the Garden State. The first Attorney General, Abraham Browning, referred to New Jersey as an immense barrel filled with good things to eat. Bonus fact: to pluralize his job title, you would say Attorneys General, not Attorney Generals. 
Name a skyscraper. If you said the Empire State Building, it won't surprise you that New York is the Empire State. This comes from another letter written by George Washington, this one to the New York Common Council in 1785, referring to New York as the seat of the empire because of its plentiful resources and wealth. If you've ever been to New Mexico, you won't argue with its title of the Land of Enchantment. Some of the state's many natural features include the white gypsum sand dunes, the Rio Grande Gorge, the Capulin Volcano, and numerous towering red rock buttes. I'm recording this in September, and September is a great time of year to be in New Mexico. The temperature is perfect, and it's chilly roasting season. Though the dry air is a bit of an adjustment if you've grown up in 90% humidity like I have. And that's where we run out of ideas, at least for today. We'll leave you with one last state whose name is well known, but thoroughly hard to vet. Indiana is the Hoosier state. Its residents are happily called Hoosiers. But what is a Hoosier? No one knows for sure. There are more theories than you could shake a stalk of corn at. It's a mispronunciation of huzzah. It's a corruption of the question, who's here? Or it's a reference to workmen hired by Samuel Hoosier on the Ohio Falls Canal. Take your pick. Maybe they should have stuck with the other motto, Crossroads of America. Thanks for spending part of your day with me. Today's episode was brought to you by the word cockle. Cockle.